By late 1915, more than one year into the First World War, it became apparent that the terrible conflict would not end anytime soon. All over Canada, there were seemingly never-ending calls made for young men to enlist. When several young black men decided to enlist in St. John, they were rejected because of their race. They fought back, though, winning their right to fight. You're listening to Backyard History, the hidden stories that happen in your own backyard. The podcast version of the weekly history column running in newspapers across the Maritimes. With your host and author, Andrew McLean. In an effort to attract new volunteers, New Brunswick revived its long-gone old famous military unit from a century before, the 104th Regiment. In order to drive recruitment in the new regiment, a series of massive rallies, each attracting thousands of people, were held all over the province. These carefully choreographed and deliberately emotional events were expertly gauged to rouse the feelings of those attending. Such a thing had never been seen before in the mostly rural and rather poor New Brunswick. The highlight of these rallies were when a badly wounded veteran, freshly home from the front, named Major Guthrie, who was still bandaged up from his war wounds, struggled to rise from his seat and limped over to the regiment's new commander, Lieutenant Colonel George Fowler. The rather rotund and mustached Fowler was a member of Parliament representing Kings and Albert counties for the Conservative Party, and he had been recently appointed to be commander of the new 104th Regiment. The wounded Major Guthrie would then tremblingly hand Fowler a sword. This sword had been worn by an officer in the original 104th Regiment in the famous march from Fredericton to Quebec in the year 1813. This sword is handed to you, sir, the Major would say, because you are taking with you so many of the noblest, the best, and the most courageous of our sons. Fowler would speak next at these rallies. Until that point, the purpose of the war was somewhat muddled, and even at the time, people didn't entirely understand what caused the First World War. In fact, historians still argue over it today. Fowler, however, was much more direct at these rallies, making the case that Canada itself was at risk of being invaded by Germany. He would say, If Germany wins this war, the British Isles will still be British, but Canada will become a German colony. We're not helping Britain alone. There is a greater need of helping ourselves. If you want to continue to retain the freedom you now enjoy and desire to keep the privilege you now hold of saying how you will be governed, then it is time you answer the call to arms. If we do not win, every liberty we hold so dear will be gone forever, and we will be the slaves and vassals of Germany. He would then point at the wounded Major Guthrie and say, Mrs. Guthrie's only regret is that her two sons are not yet of age to go forth as their father has done. He would rail against those who opposed the war, frequently calling them out by name, which would inevitably end up recorded in newspapers. For example, in St. John, he said, Alfred Laverne has said that there is no need for Canadian soldiers to go beyond the boundaries of Canada. I say the sooner we get rid of such men, the better. There are men in this city who are fighting their consciousness day after day and then blaming me for the discomfort. How much longer are you going to do the wrong thing? There is a role of dishonor on which a man can get. Any man who scoffs at those who are enlisting should be branded and marked. And then patriotic music played, and thousands of people were cheering and waving flags. It would be quite the spectacle. It would be quite moving and quite influential. At that St. John rally, 104 men enlisted in the 104th Regiment after that rally. The day after that rally, 69 more men enlisted in the local recruiting office. 50 of them were white, and 19 of these men were black. Black Canadians serving in the military wasn't anything new. In fact, it was mentioned in the speech at the rally the night before that the drummer for the old 104th Regiment a hundred years before had been a black man. Two days later, 
The 50 white recruits and the 19 black recruits made their way to the 104th Regiment's base in Sussex to report for training. A letter from one of the recruits named John T. Richardson explained what happened next. He wrote in this letter, Several colored men here endeavored to enlist in Canada's fighting forces for overseas and were rejected because of our color. On arrival at Camp Sussex, we met the second commanding officer who acted very rude to us and even insulted us and ordered us away and told us to go to Ontario to a colored formation there. Soon after, Lieutenant Colonel Fowler wrote a letter to the Canadian Expeditionary Force headquarters in Halifax specifically asking that these 19 black recruits be discharged. He plainly outlined his reasons for rejecting the black men trying to enlist in this letter, writing, These men were Negroes and I rejected them on the grounds that it would be against the interest of the battalion to have them. I have been fortunate to have secured a very fine class of recruits, and I did not think it was fair to these men that they should have to mingle with Negroes. His request startled the Halifax headquarters, who were unsure what to do with this bizarre request. They notified the federal government up in Ottawa. Meanwhile, the 19 men organized a letter-writing campaign among St. Johners, who were outraged at how these men had been treated. One of the 19 men, John T. Richardson, wrote a lengthy letter to none other than the Minister of Defense, Sam Hughes. That was the letter we saw earlier, and this letter continued. It is clearly shameful and insulting. These men were willing to defend the flag with their lives, but have been insulted and ignored by the military authorities. Sam Hughes, the Minister of Defense who received this letter, is really far too complicated to really even begin to get into. He on one hand, virtually single-handedly created the Canadian Army, but he also was, well, kind of crazy. Not my words, though. Deputy Prime Minister George Foster wrote in his diary, There is only one feeling about Sam, that he is crazy. Conservative MP Angus MacDonald told the Prime Minister, That man is insane. Wealthy industrialist Sir Joseph Falville called him mentally unbalanced with low cunning and cleverness often associated with the insane. And the Prime Minister himself wrote in his memoirs that Sam Hughes was so eccentric as to justify the conclusion that his mind was unbalanced. And that's the Defence Minister. There was certainly no knowing for sure how Sam Hughes might react to this letter. He was himself no stranger to discrimination. He definitely discriminated against French Canadians and Catholics, and, and he really hated the British Army, and this list could go on for a while. But as soon as Sam Hughes got the letter, he wrote back to John T. Richardson, saying that he had given instructions that, quote, colored men are to be permitted to enlist in any battalion. And furthermore, that he was passing along John's letter to the general to investigate what had happened there. Sam Hughes went on to say, and this is a direct quote, I will not, however, lend myself to the fad of giving them a regiment any more than I intend to have a regiment of one-eyed men, or men with yellow mustaches, or men with red hair. But having a black-only unit certainly wasn't something that these black soldiers had asked for or wanted. However, Sam Hughes changed his mind only a few months later, and he did create black-only units, and these were only used to do construction. But in that several month long window between Sam Hughes's mood swings, <laughs> several black Canadians enlisted in the infantry and went on to fight in the First World War. One such soldier was rank and weary from the little New Brunswick town of Woodstock. Weary's family had lived in Woodstock for generations. His ancestors on his father's side were probably loyalists who had fled the United States after the Revolution. Relations between the races and Little Woodstock seemed to have been generally quite friendly and amicable, at least on the surface, and segregation was not readily apparent. Rankin Weary was the star pitcher in the Woodstock Federals baseball team. He traveled all over the Maritimes in Maine playing with the team. 
If there was any controversy about his baseball team being racially mixed, I certainly wasn't able to find any signs of it in my research. Rankin Weary's father had died in 1911, when he was 16 years old, and he would eventually leave college school to find odd jobs around town to support his mother and sister. His reasons for enlisting were likely economic. The army paid one dollar a day, which was a relatively large salary at the time. Indeed, in his letter to Sam Hughes, Richardson had noted that most of the 19 men who had been rejected were enlisting because they were poor and they needed the money. Every month that he was in the army, Rankin Weary sent $25 of his monthly pay to his mother, Jessie, back in Woodstock. It doesn't seem that the 21-year-old Rankin Weary encountered any problems when he was enlisting in the 104th Regiment. One possible reason for this was suggested by historian John Williamson, who noted that this wasn't necessarily uncommon, saying that resistance to their service was met when black Canadians enlisted en masse, but not, it appears, when they reported one by one. Two days after successfully enlisting, Rankin Weary reported to Camp Sussex, and he soon proceeded overseas for training. In December of 1916, Weary was transferred to the 5th Canadian Mounted Rifles, and he was sent to the front, in the bloody and the muddy European trenches. There, he not only had to worry about the constant bullets from snipers and shells from artillery, but also about disease. One serious illness, which may have affected as many as one-fifth of the soldiers on the front, was trench fever. This was passed through bites from lice, and it caused a sharp fever, muscle and body pains, and even cardiac problems. Rankin Weary was hospitalized with trench fever three times during the war. First time he caught it was when he was fighting at the Battle of Vimy Ridge. He fought on in the battle, even while sick with this really serious illness, and he only went to the hospital after it had been won. When he showed up at the hospital, he was deemed so sick that he was sent all the way back to England, where it took him one month to recover. When he recovered, he was transferred to the 13th Reserve Battalion, which was an all-New Brunswick regiment. He served a remarkable seven tours in the trenches with them, fighting at major battles, including both of the battles of Arras, Amiens, Drocourt, and at the Canal du Nord, where the Canadians broke through the Hindenburg Line, which was the strongest of the German defenses, which were once thought invincible. Between his seven tours on the front, he had some opportunities to relax. And one of the favorite activities of Canadian soldiers was to play baseball when they were on leave in England. The entertainment-starved British civilians would come from far and wide to watch this strange new North American sport be played by soldiers on leave. The military authorities leaned into this. They established leagues for the entertainment of both their soldiers and the civilians alike, and they set up championship baseball leagues for the soldiers to compete in. The baseball-loving Rankin Weary immediately joined his regimental baseball team as soon after arriving in England in 1916. He's thought to have been the first black man to play baseball overseas. This was some 31 years before Major League Baseball integrated. Rankin Weary became the star shortstop on his regimental team, which won the Canadian Division Championships in June of 1918, five months before the war ended. On October 7th, 1918, only five weeks before the war ended, Rankin Weary was taking part in operations near the small town of Raliancourt in France when his company came under heavy artillery bombardment. In desperation, he dove into what was called a funk hole for cover from the oncoming shells. These were small dugouts in the trenches where soldiers would sit in and drape a little piece of canvas over themselves when it was raining to stay dry. They were not particularly protected, and Rankin Weary was struck directly by an enemy shell, dying instantly. One friend who served with them, Corporal Stevenson, wrote a letter to his mother, Jesse Weary, saying, He was a good soldier and very popular amongst the boys and the officers, and will be missed by all who knew him. 
There are very few Woodstock boys left. I miss him very much. The letter was published in Woodstock's local paper, who declared, Rankin Weary died fighting for humanity's rights. That was Backyard History with your host, Andrew McLean. Thanks for listening and stay tuned for another hidden story that happened in your own backyard. Produced by Jordan Lozier.